All right, good afternoon, everybody. Event Trader here, just uh, getting ready to take a quick look around at what we should be expecting over the next 18 hours. I'm going to be joined on uh, joined with Scott here, and we're going to go through some of the earnings that I posted up there, uh, just some quick thoughts on them, and then go through with Scott and take a look at the charts. I'm uh, going to cover up some of the, the macro and what to expect, but uh, overall a relatively slow day. One small bit of house cleaning here, my long in the S&P. My plan right now is to take off another piece. Uh, for about a seven point gain here and then I'm going to move just move my stops to the 2810 entry point and keep that on the remaining half position overnight basically it's about a quarter size position overall at this point but that'll lock in some profits for seven and eight point gains uh, not the greatest trade in the world but uh, you know at least it's profitable and Putting those stops in at the entry will lock in those profits. That's one of the nice things about futures is the liquidity. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about the stops getting jumped or anything along those lines. So uh, one thing I would also note, too, I was encouraged to see that the market held up pretty well despite what one could see as a relatively hawkish language in that beige book. Um, perhaps it's being overridden by the Jerome Powell testimony, but uh, obviously some of the comments that were seen in there on the pro producer prices and the uh, costs and the uh, rise of inflation are worth keeping an eye on. Uh, the economy continues to perform well, so obviously a plus for the markets there but um, overall uh, closing near the highs it's not a bad sign and willing to allow a small piece of that S&P long that I have in the futures to go overnight taking a look on the macro side as you can see in my comment there's not a lot going on over the next 18 hours you never know when that headline is going to come out to shake up things and of course Steve Bannon's going to be speaking later on CNBC. I'm not sure how much of an influence he would have over the markets at this point, but something to keep an eye out on. And headline risk, as always, we need to watch. But in the U.S., we got the initial claims data out at 8:30. Uh, we're also going to have the July Philadelphia Fed survey due out at 8:30. Um, the Empire number earlier in the week was was solid, so. Look, I uh, had a small beat there, so looking to see if the Philly Fed can follow up, but obviously it would be a positive for the markets if we see sentiment data remain strong. Uh, then we got the June leading indicators number out at 10 a.m. Briefing.com consensus stands at plus 0.4%, and then we will get our natural gas inventories at 10.30 looking on the international side uh, one thing I do not have in there that I should have add was uh, we got an EU China summit on trade I don't know if any deals are going to be announced but I uh, want to keep that in mind uh, we saw the EU already strike a deal with Japan and now they're on to China and uh, they're actually going to be in the US next week uh, Jean-Claude Juncker is, uh, who heads up the EU discussions on trade will be in to meet with the Trump administration so uh, some positive comments from Larry Kudlow earlier in the day with regards to the fact that the markets could be presently or pleasantly surprised by a deal with Europe so we definitely want to keep an eye out from their visit over to the states here but the only other items of note on the international front is that the Australia jobs report out tonight uh, there's also going to be a quarterly business report due they're both out at 9 30 p.m. Then we'll get some UK retail sales at 4.30. Uh, the pound's certainly been weak as of late, so uh, miss here could lead to a little bit further uh, concern around sterling. And then we got a Spanish 10-year bond auction, but not expecting that to have a major impact on the markets. But really the key for the markets is going to be these earnings reports and uh, we have a list that we're going to take a look at here just waiting for Scott to jump in to join us I'm here Gaff hey Scott how are you doing today I'm okay it's hump day yeah any any early thoughts on uh, the markets here uh, I'm just surprised it's holding up as well as it is to tell you the truth you know I figured uh, you know, you take a look at something. Let's take a look at the Dow here, all right, for the last couple of sessions. Um, 
just can't seem to really maintain any sort of pressure. I mean, there's this consistent underlying bid in the market just lifting things higher here. Um, and I don't mean to complain about that, uh, but just a little bit too short-term overbought for my taste. I would really rather see uh, a, a pullback that can be maintained for at least one day, maybe two days. Uh, nothing crazy, just something to reset the charts rather than feeling the need to chase stocks, uh, you know, higher after a significant run-up last week and then more this week. So, anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of why I, uh, I've i been leaning long the last two days. I just uh, posted that taking a piece off is the fact that every, every, there's every reason for the market to roll over, yet we haven't. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's kind of been what, and then, you know, with financials finally getting into gear, I thought that, uh, you know, perhaps that is what the market was missing to finally get over that 2800 level with some sort of conviction. But, yeah. you know, we still got a lot of earnings to come out, and I'll be curious to see the market reaction. So let's uh, start going through some of these take a look at some of the charts and uh, you know we could kind of expand upon uh, the talk we had earlier uh, off air on steel plays I'm sure people would be curious to hear some of the thoughts that you're seeing in terms of the charts mm -hmm. but first up that we want to take a look at is Alcoa and i um, curious to see if you, if you pull up a five minute chart Scott you can see that there's uh, some, some people a little nervous about this ahead of the earnings it would appear um, certainly want to keep an eye out on and uh, for for a little bit more detail you know obviously I wanted to keep my post in line a little bit make it a little bit more uh, readable for people but we do have earnings previews for a number of these companies I'll point them out AA being one and uh, with that uh, uh, you know one of the things that I think we're going to be curious to see is whether you know, obviously the tariffs and how that's impacting the action here. Uh, you know, the stock was holding near its 200-day moving average of 48.64 at the time of this writing, but since then it's slipped down a little bit below that. Um, the stock is down about 20% from its last earnings report when it hit a 52-week high shortly afterwards. But we certainly want to keep an eye out on its forward-looking guidance. Uh, around the aluminum demand, which is, stands right now at plus four and a half to five and a half percent. But uh, Scott, what are you looking at in this chart? Yeah, I mean, not too much going on. It's been an underperformer, like you said, since that last earnings report. Uh, just struggling right there with the 200-day, 50-day moving average resistance around $48. So that's going to be a key inflection point that it's going to have to get above. It definitely does tend to gap in response to earnings, if I just go back every three months, I see there's a pretty significant gap uh, in response to earnings. So, uh, at the very least, I don't think it's going to be staying around this forty-seven, forty-eight dollar uh, area come tomorrow. It's going to be probably above fifty, or it's going to be breaking down below forty-six. All right, Mo moving on to the next name, we're going to take a look at American Express. This is one that um, you know we had talked about last quarter, Scott, where it was able to see a pop, nice pop from that 93 level up towards 100, but simply hasn't really been able to get above that level. Um, you know, the stock hit, I believe, it was an all-time yeah, it was an all-time high. Um, this would have been. Oh, I'll just move back in. Here, uh, back in, in May, uh, May, uh, May twenty second. Yep. When, when it hit one hundred three twenty four. Yep. Um, but uh, this is one, Scott. I think uh, when you're looking at it on a weekly chart, that falls into your wheelhouse in terms of liking it long, just because it had that nice upward trend going from early twenty sixteen into uh, the beginning of twenty eighteen, and since then we've really seen it just kind of chop around at that ninety to one hundred level. It's trading at one hundred two fifty eight, just a biscuit shy of that uh, all time high. And uh, expectations are certainly good for American Express. They need to beat on the bottom line because the general view is that the provisions should be running a little bit lower and that they should uh, be hitting their revenue growth target of at least 8% in, in um, 2018. Uh, we'll also have to keep an eye out on that FY EPS guidance, which is in the 690 to 730 range. So uh, strong quarter here, Scott. Do you like that as a potential breakout candidate? Of, of course I do. And remind me, Gavin, what, uh, what exactly is the value of a biscuit? 
when you say it's only a biscuit? Uh, well, well, in this case, it would, it would be about 60 cents. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, you know, I love all-time highs, and this one's just been a stellar uptrend for quite some time. Uh, Year-to-date, it's been extremely choppy, uh, but overall, I just carved out this... Uh, it's been carving out, I should say, uh, this almost ascending triangle pattern the last six months or so. Definitely got some key resistance up here, 102, 103, which it is challenging. But path of least resistance at this stage, I would think, is to the upside into all-time high territory. I mean, there's only so many times you got to hit that same level until you eventually bust through. If it does gap down a little bit, um, you do have this potential multi-month uptrend in effect right around the 200-day moving averages, which comes into play. looks like around $97 or so. So we'll see how it plays out. It's, but I, I like this one on the long side for sure. All right. Next up, we're going to move to Crown Castle. Uh, tip your symbol CCI. Uh, Scott, we were talking about this on Friday, and um, you know this is uh, one I, one of those tower plays. I've, I've got the AMT long. I posted some thoughts on AMT because there's some concerns I do have around it. Uh, one of the things I liked about AMT was that it had the best debt out of all the towers, and at the time we were seeing a rise in uh, interest rates, which had that uh, front and center. But they also have some issues with the India unit and uh, concerns about a stronger dollar. CCI, though, does not have those same concerns, and uh, they're also expanding into that fiber and the small cell for the 5G that we were talking about on Friday afternoon. So uh, this is another one, kind of been trading in a relatively tight range in that 102 to 112 uh, area, basically since last November. Since last November, um, the all-time high on this one is 110.65, which was hit in early November of 2017. It's it, it's it's up towards those levels into tonight's report, um, but certainly want to keep a close eye to see if they could get above that 112 level and uh, commentary around that small cell and whether or not it's having an impact on the top and bottom line will certainly be of interest. But uh, one that's recently gotten above its 200-day moving average and seen a bit of a 4% uh, extension over that. Scott, what are you looking at in this chart? Yeah, over the last, what, three weeks or so, there's been some pretty hefty accumulation in this name. Uh, I like it. Like you said, it's got to get back above that 112 level. From what I could tell, uh, it's probably going to do it unless it uh, disappoints significantly with the earnings report. If it gets through 112, you're going back up to all-time highs right around that 115 area. All right. So we're looking at a couple of names that were near their all-time highs. Now we're going to hit one that's uh, been been treading water barely a little bit uh, and on the weaker side and that's eBay ticker symbol EBAY of course uh, there's been some concerns uh, as it's fallen below its 200 day moving average about a slowdown in its gross merchandise value I've uh, seen a pickup from uh, from competition in the space there. Uh, w one of the key things that's been followed is there is going to be the discussion around linearity in the quarter. And basically the company was looking at a weak April, but there's uh, but channel checks were looking at a pickup in May and June, uh, which certainly could bode w well for the name if it's able to uh, beat and then also guide higher. The company should be gotten for Q3 and FY18 on the uh, in its press release too, trading right around its 50-day moving average, but certainly some cause for concern, and it still remains in uh, the downward trend ever since it hit its 52-week high, which would have been back in um, early February when it touched 46.99 back on February 1st. Um, Scott, what levels are you looking at in terms of uh, trying to confirm a breakout from this downside trend that we're seeing it in? Yeah, it's got to definitely fight its way through the 38 area. I say if it starts clearing 39, which is going to be around the 200-day moving average and that downtrend line off the year-to-date highs, uh, it starts trading up to 39s. you got a potential uh, reversal of momentum, which could take it back up towards uh, that $41, $42 area. Uh, but overall, you know, that the proof is on, the burden of proof is on buyers right here at this stage. they got to really kind of break this uh, downward vibe that's been going on here. Um, otherwise, if the, the, the report's not good and sellers take hold of this thing, I would suspect your first support's at 36 we're near recent lows, uh, but then you're looking at multi-month support down around 34. 
All right, moving to the next one, another uh, weaker tech name. Uh, International Business Machines, ticker symbol, of course, is IBM. Uh, this one has just been seen some pretty... Uh, Pretty big dips on earnings uh, the last two quarters. Had that nice surprise back in uh, October 2017, um, which I'm, which you could, uh, you'll be able to see on the chart here in a second. Uh, but big big pop up there, and people were hoping that maybe the turnaround was in play, but that has not come to fruition. And now we're seeing it battling to hold up that 140 level. And there continues to be caution around this stock. Is uh, the early whispers is that the company might need to um, lower its Q3 and uh, guide Q3 below consensus and tweak its FY18 EPS guidance lower. It's currently at at least 1380 for FY18. Uh, so Scott, what are you looking at? What, what 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 does this need to hold in order to get you intrigued on the long side? Or you just see this as a, as a short with some further downside action? Uh, that's an interesting call. So, I mean, obviously it's been out of favor. Uh, it, it has held that 140 support level over the last year or so. Uh, yeah, it probed it, but then it quickly uh, attracted bids soon after. Uh, so that's going to be your main uh, level to watch for if things are weak. You don't really want it cracking back underneath the 140 level to rechallenge those lows. Um, overall, I, I'm... I would actually guess that this doesn't get much of a reaction to earnings. Um, just based upon the pattern that I could see here, if it really needs to get back above this recent uh, resistance level around 147 um, to really kind of spark some interest, maybe get back towards last April's bearish gap around the 152 area. Um, but overall, I mean, I, this is just a sit on your hands type of stock. If it if it can't bust out between 140 and 147, um, there's nothing to do here. All right. Um, next up, we're going to take a look at United Rental ticker symbol URI, and I threw this one on just because uh, you know it's certainly been a weaker name. Uh, another one of those below its 200-day moving average and in a long downward trend since hitting a 52-week high. This one. Uh, happened to come back in on March 13th when it hit 190.74. But uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting about this was that uh, a lot of people believe that the estimates could be low on this one. So, you know, obviously it's a must beat in that scenario. However, that headline could look a lot better, too, in this same scenario which could lead us up to a test that 50 day and uh, the 159 area or the 200 day at 163 certainly some heavy resistance above but that low bar should make for an interesting report and reaction yeah for sure uh like you said it's got to get back above the all this resistance around 160 163 uh you do have some pretty key support down here around the 140 let's go with 143 145 vicinity um, and that's going to be a must hold for the stock. Otherwise, you're looking at uh, a 140 level, and then if that cracks 140, you can have some serious downside, maybe da down to like the 127 spot. All right. Next up, we're going to take a look at uh, Med Device Play Danaher, ticker symbol DHR. Uh, it came off a really nice beat and raise in Q1, but the stock's still down 4% since that, uh, basically consolidating around that 100 level. Uh, some similarities in the charts to American Express. I don't know if it's as defined of a consolidation pattern as you'd like to see, Scott, and I guess that's my primary question for you on this name. Yeah, what it, just remind me, they're industrial, what do they make, do you know? Uh, medical devices, I, I, I don't oh, know okay. the exact devices that, that they do, but uh, okay. th so, so they're in that IBB space, basically. Yeah, I don't trade this one too often. Um, real choppy consolidative action year to date, uh, even more narrowing as of late these last few weeks here. So uh, usually when you get this narrowing range, especially in higher price stocks, you can expect some sort of explosion in volatility to come about here and earnings look like a good catalyst for that to happen. So if this thing can start clearing 101, uh, I would suspect that it's going to start challenging the year-to-date highs around 104. 
and if it starts breaking down, say below, let's go with 97, which is right around the 200-day moving average, uh, you could have a pretty significant drop, say down to the uh, year-to-date lows around 92. So pretty much uh, anybody's ball game at this stage here, but you are looking for some sort of significant move away from this multi-week uh, consolidation that's been going on. All right. Next up, um, we have Nucor, uh, which is a steel play that we were um, teasing a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I, I know, Scott, when we were first talking about it, uh, it, it sounded to me like you were kind of leaning a little bit more on the long side for these names, given the charts. Yep. Um, there's certainly a lot of outliers that are going to be involved and a lot of fundamental risk in the steel names just because of those tariffs that are going on. Um, you know, Nucor, they, they, uh, Rob Reed did a really nice write-up for them. Uh, you guys all know Robert for his work on the Grow X and everything, but uh, he originally cut his teeth in on the steel names, so he's got a pretty fair um, idea on them, and that's going to be one area that we're going to have in focus, and maybe we can even bring him on tomorrow for a discussion of Nucor and the other steel names, as there should be plenty of volatility around them. Uh, one of the key things for Nucor is that their end markets are the auto appliance and construction area and what we're going to want to keep a close eye on is whether or not they've been able to pass on some of the higher costs that we're seeing and if they have some higher pricing power to push on to their customers and that'll be really reflected in their gross margins and in their earnings per share so we certainly want to see how they're performing on the bottom line uh, revs naturally will be important and we're going to want to take a closer look at that pricing uh, commentary in the press release but uh, for, for me I'm kind of on the sidelines until I see some of these earnings and how they react but Scott what was it that you were seeing that was interesting to you in the steel names on the long side potentially on a technical basis yeah so if you look at this year-to-date chart here it's been a pretty sloppy range uh, overall but I just kind of like the fact that it kept bouncing off the psychological round number of $60 uh, multiple times and it also started to react pretty positively to the 200 day moving average which has been a slightly on the rise here so at the very least I felt like uh, there's some pretty hefty accumulation going on at these key technical levels down here. Uh, obviously they're selling into strength up above $68, so that's going to be a key resistance level for the stock if it does start to move higher. Uh, but overall I thought this was somewhat of a under accumulation stock. Um, also with the same thing, you know, you said there's worries around this, um, the steel sector. Uh, well, if there's so many worries, they would be selling these things off and they'd all be in significant downtrends. And so I, I feel like the worries really aren't uh, there. They're not priced into price action, so I kind of feel like they're set up to go higher. Um, out of curiosity, what chart do you like the best out of these steel names? You know, that was a good call. So I was thinking about actually going after U.S. steel because uh, I felt like the resistance level was um, right there around $38, and that would just be a nice clean breakout. Um, and I do believe that, uh, whereas fundamentally, I've heard Rob Reed talk uh, multiple times, I think, about Steel Dynamics or even Schnitzner Steel. Um, but then even going to a lower-priced one, AKS, this thing tends to move pretty well, and this one's starting to break out already. Uh, outside the fact that it's already uh, come, has a 200-day moving average there, it's, it's breaking out today to about a four-month high here, right over that 480, 490 level. Um, so there's a couple good-looking stocks out there overall. Uh, Nucor is not really, you know, a, tr a real big mover, fast mover, but I would say uh, off the bat I'd go after U.S. Steel, and then maybe I'd look at this low price one, AK Steel. All right. Next up, uh, we're going to take a look at a staple, and uh, that's Philip Morris, which has been just kind of tre treading along in, uh, in the 78 to 80 area for the most part since its last earnings. Um, stock got hit, of course, uh, with the rest of the staples due to some of those rising cost commentaries that we had seen. Um, also, a little bit of a slowdown there for PM. This is the fourth largest weighting in the XLP. I uh, want to keep an eye out on those Q2 gross margin expectations as a read for the staple sector. Um, expectations are for approximately 63.5% and the EBITDA number as well, which is expected to come around 
3.1 billion. But uh, it is putting a little bit of a bottoming pattern here. Uh, we've seen a pickup in the XLP, but obviously Philip Morris has not been uh, jumping in there. Uh, Scott, you see anything in this? Yeah, what's the matter with all these millennials? Is smoking not cool anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. We uh, we got to get it back in. Uh, you think Mad Men would have uh, driven some yeah, people right. back to all the, the habit? All the cool kids smoked growing up when I was <laughs> there. You know? uh, yep. Hence, I never smoked. So, <laughs> uh, no. Anyway, uh, yeah, this thing just got absolutely destroyed here. The last what is this? Almost a year right now, sitting off those highs about oh thirty six percent. I believe the dividend is still stable, and I think that's really kind of the only thing that's holding this thing up still, uh, yeah, it's, preventing it's it from collapsing like below this uh, multi-year support level right around the $75 level. Um, so that's really going to be the key thing here, whether I think it's the, the dividend. Um, it's just pretty fat, I think. The yield's 5.5. It's fading out there, Gav, a little bit. Just speak up. The yield's 5.54. 5.54, yeah. So I, I'd be more curious to see what they say about that dividend. Because um, I think if they cut that in any degree, that's going to be a um, you know game changer for sure. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or get a Kardashian and start smoking on uh, on their Instagram account. Perhaps that could bring it back oh, yeah. in vogue yeah. or something, right? Maybe they should, maybe their client relations should be. Uh, Hitting her up, yeah, right. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Yeah. All right, next up, we're going to take a look at uh, this. is in one of the more interesting names from my perspective. That's SAP, which is of course the German software company. Um, you know, it's going to give, give us a good read on the cloud space. But I'm also just curious to uh, see their commentary around uh, the global markets, given some the, the fact that tech's really kind of been at the focus of a lot of the early talk with the Ch with China and U.S. on the um, on the trade war front. SAP to, is taking advantage of that. That's been one of the German companies that's recently uh, announced a new deal in China. So uh, recently hit a 52-week high of 121.94, set back on June 14th. We have the stock uh, testing right around that area. Actually, I think it might even be. It's yeah, it, 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 it hit an all-time high mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, s some people upbeat about this one ahead of tomorrow's earnings. And again, we've seen a, a little bit of an early divergence, and it's still way too early to call this uh, the theme for Q2. But of the uh, European uh, tech names outperforming some of the U.S. counterparts, at least uh, you know from what we saw with Netflix, and then the TXN guidance, basically just using that as as the reasoning early on. But uh, there there was a few European names out overnight that uh, had some uh, good earnings on the tech side. So this is going to be the latest one, big big cloud place. So we're going to be looking in at CRM and Oracle as well for any reaction. But uh, Scott, you like this chart? Yeah, of course I do. All time highs, uh, big uptrend. It is an ADR, so it tends to gap around a little bit. Uh, if it doesn't go to the upside, well, then you have you still have uh, a pretty solid uptrend at multiple support levels to consider buying on weakness. All right, and uh, finally we're, we're running up uh, close to the bell here, so we're just going to touch. Uh, we'll skip over travelers. Um, you know, we could come back and address that tomorrow if if that becomes a story. But uh, I wanted to take a look at UNP because uh, that transportation space has certainly been hot as of late, and I uh, just want to keep an eye on this one here. Uh, I recently it recently bounced off its 100-day moving average. Uh, the CSX results, of course, earlier in the week bode well for UNP, and uh, it's not all that far away from its 52-week high. We saw CSX make a nice rally. Um, into its 52-week high following earnings. The uh, company did provide guidance on May 31st, so m maybe a little bit less of a surprise here at the moment, but one that we want to keep an eye out on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so here's a chart of the Dow Jones Railroad Index, and it looks great. I mean, it's been consolidating the last couple of weeks uh, at, along its highs here, and then with uh, s the positive response in CSX earnings today, um, and then NSC, uh, Norfolk Southern, is also up near its highs. Uh, UNP is a little bit of a laggard here, so but uh, you know, strong group, strong sector, strong space. Uh, IYT looked like it was potentially rolling over, but then turned a whole corner here. So you have a, a what looked bearish is now turning around. So I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and say that it kind of has more upside potential. Uh, key support right here around 139, 140. 
All right. Uh, just looking at uh, feedback to somebody who's asking about PSXP. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely take a look at that. Um, we're bumping up into uh, earnings, so we're going to have a bunch of uh, flipping out. I'm uh, not sure when they're reporting, but uh, I'll do my best to get some thoughts up on that ahead of their earnings report. So uh, thanks for the sub for who wrote in about that. Uh, and there, there we go with the uh, bell. So we're going we're gonna to jump over and start taking a look at these earnings. Scott, you want to take them through the close of the day, and I'll jump on if anything of interest pops out. No problem. All right. All right, so we got the Dow looking like it's going to close We're up around 81 points, give or take. Uh, S&P is up approximately 6. The Nasdaq comp is looking pretty much flat on the session. It's slightly negative, somewhat of a lagger today, uh, but not in any sort of heavy distribution type of means. Uh, interesting today to see small caps and mid caps make a little bit of a comeback. And I want to just show those charts quick. Um, they have been lagging over the last couple of sessions here and kind of setting up for this uh, potentially bullish pullback pattern. You know, off that, they, they stole that around their June high. Here's the mid caps, MDY. And they could be potentially setting up for a breakout uh, into higher ground. Take a look over at the IWM. Kind of had somewhat of a similar price pattern there. It stalled out against the June highs and it's just kind of carving out this somewhat of a bullish uh, flag pattern in here in July. So again, my logic is the reason why these things have been out of favor or just kind of pulling back a little bit is because we've seen so many earning reports from the larger caps, especially from those financials and banks and a few other names. So I think that's one of the main uh, reasons why uh, they've just been kind of out of favor, you know, for now. But as I've said always, you know, I'd make the comparison to uh, larger caps and small caps and uh, to the military. Uh, the larger caps being the generals, the smaller caps being the infantry. It looks like the generals or the larger caps are running into battle uh, and the infantry or the small caps are kind of hesitant to follow right now. Um, that could mean that the large caps get slaughtered. Or what it means is that the infantry will eventually follow their lead and move higher. And right now, I think I'm leaning a little bit towards the latter side, where uh, it looks like mid caps and small caps are set up to follow the lead of larger caps. Uh, hey Scott, yeah, uh, just breaking in. CP Canadian Pacific, um, nice little five cent beat uh, beat on revs. And uh, their operating ratio, which we saw earlier with CSX, is uh, lower, which is positive for them. Um, so a another good uh, rail report here. So want to keep an eye on CP to see if it follows suit. Uh, breaking out a little bit above that 188 area today. All-time high, or uh, the 52-week high was 196 setback in, uh, on June 14th. Cool. Um, yeah, so we had transportation stocks, uh, you know, pretty strong today. Obviously, we, that was a big boost from the United Airlines, uh, UAL, which had a monster reaction to uh, its earnings response up about 9%, which brought it right up to the year-to-date Jan high. So uh, pretty big move there. That, that busted out a whole bunch of other airlines. Uh, you got Delta that gapped up higher today. American Airlines, not too much of a reaction. And we've stated this one before, uh, how this one is probably one of the worst performing in the group and is probably an avoid. Uh, something like uh, Southwest Airlines, also a pretty weak performer, but that did make that breakout over that $53 uh, resistance area that we had highlighted yesterday. Uh, and JetBlue was another interesting one too kind of a sideways consolidation range that it's trying to break out of here. Hey, Scott, uh, IBM breaking higher here. Um, nice eight cent beat on the on the bottom line. Uh, taking a quick look for revenues here, 30, that's the first half. Um, just looking for the revenue number, uh, 20 billion on revs, which beat the 19.8 billion expectations. Perhaps most importantly, they are reaffirming their uh, EPS guidance, we discussed about that there was a concern that they could lower that, but um, they continue to expect to see EPS of at least 1380, which is in line. Uh, th they also are reaffirming their free cash flow of approximately 12 billion for FY18. I uh, do not see Q3 earnings here. Um, 
So we'll continue to take a look out on this, but uh, probably couched as a better than feared for IBM. And, uh, you know, that's a positive for the name. We talked about how it's trying to find a base in that 140 area, mm -hmm. and uh, this should help give it a boost. And, uh, you know, if we could get it above that 147 level, yeah, that's then, it. Uh, you know, make, make that run towards a, the 100 day at 148, and then you got the 200 day at 151. So uh, we could see a little bit of a squeeze over here. So uh, just a positive report there. Now we're going to jump over American Express is out. Give me two seconds to take a look at, but if you want to take a look at that IBM chart, Scott, mm -hmm. for people. Yeah, so IBM, uh, we have highlighted this uh, just a little while ago. Um, just this multi-week resistance level. This is on a 60-minute time frame, in case you're getting confused. Uh, but it's right around 147. So it's really got to bust out above 148 in order to get some more upside potential. I'll switch over to a daily here real quick. Uh, you can see that was the uh, 147 level that acted as prior support uh, a couple months ago, and now it's acting as current resistance. So it really kind of needs to pop up over that 147, 148 area in order to bring back the 150s. Uh, otherwise, you're looking down at maybe a potential retest of the lows near 140. All right, it's got AXP selling off a little bit here. Uh, revs a little light, um, and then the earnings per share beat by three cents. But recall we were talking about expectations were for them to see a little bit more of a beat here. Uh, they are raising their 2018 revenue expectations, though, to at least 9%. Uh, their prior guidance was at least 8%. Uh, they are reaffirming their full year EPS guidance where people were probably looking for a raise there, but certainly a bit of a sell the news reaction to AXP. Um, the report overall doesn't look too bad, but again, you know, we're talking about this needing that uh, a little bit of juice just to get it above uh, to you know to fresh all-time highs and break it out to the next level. And this report's a little bit more pedestrian and in line, and certainly enough, uh, not enough to. Uh, provide that boost at the moment. So we'll keep this one on. Uh, this could potentially be a buy the dip candidate, in my opinion. But uh, the Q2 results fallen a little short of some uh, higher expectations. Yeah, definitely under pressure here. Just broke underneath the $100 mark. Looks like it might have potential to bounce off this 99 area. Um, again, it's a wild west, this after hours trading stuff. Even if you got in there, you're going to immediately lose on uh, you know, 30, 40 cents for slippage purposes. Uh, look at this, it's already back over 150 as I was talking. So, uh, you know, key support right there around 99. We'll see what happens tomorrow. You know, like I said, wild west trading in the after hours. This thing could wind up opening up around 103 uh, tomorrow yeah. morning, you know. Yeah, we, we, we've talked about this in the past, and, um, you know, as sexy as it is to get in there early and see your stock move 12% in your favor because you guessed right, um, you know, that's all fine and good, but at the end of the day, it's really just more or less a guess that you had. Uh, so uh, I've learned my lesson the hard way in trying to play earnings before the reports. I, I always think that you're better off just let it play out, or you play the run-up going into it, but um, if, I mean, if you're just trying to guess on which way a stock's going to uh, fall in terms of beats versus misses, it, it's really just a guessing game, so yeah. uh, you know, that, that's always good to point out, and we'll continue to keep an eye on this American Express. It's not a horrible uh, report, but uh, again, you know, a little bit loftier expectations around those all-time highs, and yeah. this simply didn't produce the numbers that would have been necessary to give it that next level. Yeah, and the other thing too is I can't imagine anyone's trading any real size after hours in these things. Uh, it's probably, uh, if I could look at the tape, I would guarantee it's a bunch of uh, 100 lots going off. So um, you don't see anybody with a uh, thousand share lots going off. Right, right. Like that guy in the wolf mask that was trading Apple after hours the one time. <laughs> I, I, I missed that video. You, you never saw that video? Oh, it's, pre it's pretty funny. I, I have no idea if it's real, but it's uh, <laughs> if, if anybody's out there, uh, Google um, uh, Apple after hours trading wolf mask and you'll oh, see what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's an enter entertaining couple of minutes to watch. Uh, uh, I, uh. <laughs> All right, so while we're waiting on a couple more earnings to roll out here, why don't we take a look at 
let's see uh, some more leading groups today. We had the semiconductors, which looked like they're back up at their fresh June July highs here. Sorry, um, pretty solid action going on there. They've been, you know, uh, they're they're in favor, you know, for one month. They're out of favor another month. I mean, that's basically the way this trend has been going year to date. Um, and it looks like they might actually be coming back in favor here uh, as a couple of their earnings are going to be coming out pretty soon. Uh, you could probably say the same here for the Aerospace Defense Group. Uh, we highlighted this a few weeks ago, uh, actually a, a week ago, I'm sorry, uh, with strength in Lockheed Martin and uh, Raytheon and General Dynamics and, uh, of course, Boeing, all managing to uh, lift off their late June lows and uh, making a nice recovery effort here as of late so definitely saw some nice solid strength going on there in the aerospace defense names uh, back to the jets ETF this is the airline ETF uh, again this thing might be turning a corner here go figure um, jet the, the airline sector uh, as underperforming as it has been does look like it's potentially turning around thanks to those uh, strong price reaction in United Airlines uh, earnings hey, Scott, today. Yep. Scott, with that Jets, um, J-E-T-S, right? And yep. Not, not, not going in for the football joke here, but uh, it, it, does that really have any volume in it? I'm, I'm just looking at it. I got like zero volume in this thing from... Zero. Uh, that's a good well, point. Well, not zero, but, um, it's you know... A couple thousand spotty shares. at best, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's no SPY or QQQ, but for an, ETF, right. for an ETF, it's usually around earnings season. This is when, the you know, you see those ETFs pick up in volume, obviously, um, as there's some adjustments going on and stuff. So, you know... It is what it okay. is. You don't a lot of these ETFs. You don't really need volume. Uh, they don't. Ha There's enough liquidity there yeah, for you. Yeah, they generate it for you. You know, so you don't have to really necessarily worry about the day-to-day -day volume activity that's going on. All they right, can I'll close. Create I'll close out here. So I'm just going to jump in on that one. Scott, got to pop back in in two seconds here. All right, I'll go over with the initial reaction to the downside. It looks like uh, slumping about four percent down to that 46, 45 area. Take a look at the chart there. This is the one that we said was just kind of in a tight, narrow consolidation. Really needed to get back above the 250 moving average, above 48 here, and it doesn't look like it's getting the job done. So, yeah, I mean, the quarter itself was pretty good, but their outlook is uh, not looking great. Just seeing the updated their adjusted EP EBITDA projections to 3 to 3.2 billion. The prior was uh, 3.5 to 3.7. Um, so again, this uh, kind of leads to what I was talking about in terms of the steel names where I'm curious just to see what kind of impact on the outlook some of these trade tariffs have. Certainly a great quarter for the company with a nice 20 cent beat on the bottom line. Uh, they outpaced on revenues, but uh, you know, a little bit further weakness coming in here. I'm going to take a quick look through the release, see if I can find any commentary on tariffs in it. All right, so moving right along, obviously, with transports turning higher and uh, aerospace also turning higher, that's going to actually give a boost to industrials. So industrial is actually doing a, a little bit of a new July high here, getting back above resistance levels today at that 74 level, trying to get back above the 250-day moving averages. Still kind of underperforming and slumping for the year. Uh, so there is a concern there, but it does look like it's coming back in favor here with a little bit of rotation going on in the underlying sectors. Uh, metals and mining, they were doing pretty well today. We did see a little bit of a boost in uh, steel stocks, like we said. New core should be coming out, I believe, tomorrow morning with its earnings report. Uh, hey, yeah. hey, Scott, just uh, as a heads up for that Alcoa, lowering the EBITDA outlook, uh, the primary reason for that was uh, they have a new full-year forecast for current market prices. Also, tariffs on imported aluminum 
uh, increased energy costs and some operational impacts. In particular, Alcoa notes that they incurred $15 million of costs of tariffs on imports from its foreign operations for U.S. sale. Uh, Alcoa imports were primarily from Canada, where, of course, the U.S. government Section 232 put uh, that tariff on Canada. So seeing some of the negative impacts uh, from the, from the recently announced tariffs, so uh, certainly something that we're going to want to continue to keep an eye out on. Uh, the company is continues to project its full year 2018 global deficit for both aluminum and alumina, which should be positive for pricing there. Um, in fact, they're expecting a larger global deficit in aluminum uh, to between 1.1 million and 1.5 million metric tons. Their prior estimate for this was 600,000 to 1 million metric tons. Uh, global aluminum demand for uh, Alcoa remains unchanged, projected to be at 4.25 to 5.25 percent. So, um, y you know, the outlook in the market seemed uh, pretty pretty positive. I guess it's just uh, some of the costs that are weighing on the EBIT, on uh, the EBITDA outlook there that really provided the initial selling in Alcoa. Um, it's coming down to that 46 area. Not really seeing much support until that 44, 45 level. But at this point, I would expect that to hold today based on some of this commentary that we're seeing here. Obviously, a little bit of concern going in on the tariffs, but um, you know the, up, the uptick in costs seems to be coming also a lot from those higher energy costs, which is something else to keep in mind for the steel for, uh, for, uh, producers. But the tariffs aren't having a huge impact just yet at the moment. Okay. All right, going back to uh, the sector action today, we did have uh, pretty solid gains, another continuation, follow-through, whatever you want to call it, in financials. So nice upside potential there. Take a look at this XLF chart. Uh, we do have that multi-month year-to-date downtrend line being probed here. XLF is getting back above its 200-day moving average, which is a constructive sign. Um, it's just going to put everything on the radar, put a lot more of a bullish spin on the space as it goes forward. Looks like the XLF's next resistance level is going to be around 2850 based upon that late March bearish gap. So something to keep track of. Hopefully, uh, if you've been trading and you've been listening to us, you got along some, something somewhere in the financial space as we've been pretty bullish on the group here throughout all of July. Uh, whether it was JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or whether it was one of the ETFs, uh, I think multiple uh, multiple uh, analysts and traders have come on and either taken trades in them or jumped on board them leading up to these earnings reports and the, the response so far has been quite strong. Uh, and if you missed it, you know, Gavin and Jim were on earlier this morning discussing uh, the reactions to the earnings reports and the, the, the ones that were really kind of outstanding. Um, and you can search under event, the event ticker EVENT to see that uh, discussion that was recorded earlier. And there's also a nice table associated under EVENT as well, where uh, Gavin laid it out really nice. Uh, the, in a comparison basis. I believe uh, he did like Morgan Stanley the best out of um, out of all the names. So Yes, yes Scott, I, I, j just for a follow-up on that, Morgan Stanley I liked from an investment standpoint, okay. but I, I still think Goldman's the best uh, trading vehicle, which I know you have a long in, mm -hmm. um, just because Morgan Stanley just has a little bit more heavier lifting to go, to go through and get a little bit higher here in the short term. Where Goldman, there just seems to be a little bit less resistance, and the valuation is a little bit more attractive from a shorter term angle. But Morgan Stanley's just been producing so well the last three years that uh, you know, just Gorman's doing a great job there. The entire uh, that um, brand just looks like it's really set to just kind of move to that next level. That's good to know. Good to know. Um, yeah, Goldman's just a uh, the more volatile name, being a two hundred and thirty dollars stock. It's 
uh, I believe it's part of the Dow last I checked, and uh, yeah, just it's a uh, it's a four dollar average daily range. So you just definitely get, get some nice movement and activity out of it. If it's too high price, you can you can um, always go with uh, J P Morgan. It's a nice one too. All right, looking moving right along. We got uh, software stocks acting really great here. Uh, retail seems to be holding up okay. Energy stocks, really interesting chart pattern. I highlighted this earlier today, right before the inventory data came out. Uh, I basically stated that there was a critical support level coming into play for the XLE, right there around 74. Uh, price was slumping down to fresh July lows, and it had this support level right there that it was really just necessary for it to hold. Otherwise, it could have just cracked lower and just been you know, s completely selling off. Uh, it was somewhat similar behavior going on in the OIH right around that mid $25 area. Uh, it just it just basically sidestepped a complete disaster today, these energy stocks. Um, and then the XOP was another ETF that I was tracking here, sliding right below its 50-day moving average, coming down to a multi-week uptrend line, uh, key support level right around $42, $41. And again, it just managed to sidestep uh, a complete uh, disaster here. So does that mean that they're ready for a bounce? Um, yeah, it looks like it. I mean, crude oil, we'll take a look at the USO chart, uh, had some pretty good action today. Really heavy volume yesterday. So usually when you see heavy volume spikes in a chart without a wide range bar, it tends to mean that there's a shifting of um, shifting control in the stock. A heavy seller shifted over to a, uh, a somebody that really wanted to step up and buy. Um, and they, those tend to be, uh, it could be vice versa as well, obviously. It could be uh, a, a more bearish person getting involved. Um, but, yeah. Hey, yeah, Scott, just, yeah, sorry. Uh, eBay's out. Um, revenue missed leading to a quick dip in the name, but we've seen that, obviously. A uh, little, little, little bit of um, a whippy moved down to that 3550 support area and mm -hmm. now bounced back. I don't know the volume is meaningful enough to really um, count that as a uh, big sell off by any stretch. I've uh, seen it immediately bounce back. Just taking a quick look at everything. As I noted, uh, revenue a little light of expectations. Um, two cent beat on the bottom line there. Uh, looking for the uh, gross merchandise growth, uh, which was a concern, that was up 10% uh, for the prior year quarter. Um, i got to double check. On it. I'm not sure what the expectations were, but that seems like a decent number given some of the concerns that were around and how beat up this is. Active buyers were up 4% too, which um, again is a decent number for them so I'm not sure that early selling is going to be warranted uh, looking around for their guidance taking a look at Q3 revenue of 2.64 to 2.69 uh, that looks to be a little light uh, earnings per share uh, 30, or 54 to 56 cents um, generally in line to a little bit light Full year earnings uh, is ten or revenue is ten point seven five to ten point eight five, which is below consensus. And then their NAGAP earnings per share of two twenty eight to two thirty two, slightly above. Not loving the guidance here. Uh, stocks basically back to break even, and uh, probably for good reason. This is kind of a difficult quarter to figure out given some of the mixes you know I'd say mixed bag but considering that expectations were low that's not necessarily a negative uh, whether or not it's enough to break this out of the downward trend I definitely question that uh, I think that we could see this bump into some resistance at that 38 level perhaps uh, I don't know I'd let this one play out I wouldn't be trying to lean too heavily one way or the other on eBay as we'll kind of let this one settle itself out and figure in which direction it wants to go yeah I agree I don't, I'm pretty impressed on how it managed to hold that late June early July low right at the mid 35s uh, and a pretty hefty volume too came flying in to defend this stock down at the below the $36 level um, but overall like we said it really kind of needs to uh, get back above that 38 39 resistance area if there's going to be any sort of turnaround play 
Yeah, and, and like I said, just a simple mixed bag here. Um, you know, I, th I think that guidance will certainly garner plenty of attention. Uh, the revenue miss too is of concern, but as you say, you want to watch the price action here, and uh, not really seeing a lot of people heading to the exits just at the moment. I mean, if, if I had to take a trade, I would think that we'd see a uh, move back down to that 35 area, but uh, I don't feel confident enough to really go out and and uh, take a position myself at the moment. I'd rather see this uh, play out a little bit first. Yeah, I hear you. Um, just so in case anybody's not familiar with, uh, the, rather than using the in-play page, you can always just go to the calendars, uh, drop down menu, click on earnings results, and that's going to show you all the results for the current day. If you want to see yesterday, that you click on that link there. If you want to see tomorrow, this week, or future weeks, uh, feel free to click on that. But I like to just scroll down here and it tells me how many uh, names have already been reported. Uh, now this is not going to be, this is a little bit further delayed. Obviously if you want the speed, you pay attention to in play uh, because then somebody has to grab those numbers and then upload them into this uh, calendar here. But uh, overall just a nice quick summary if you're just uh, looking to see how earnings have, um, have stacked up to each other. Um, Usually, I like to look at uh, surprise the earnings surprises. Um, so it's pretty impressive that I think um, whether it's above above or below consensus. So seeing United Rentals and Alcoa and this Data Watch and Canadian Pacific and IBM all kind of uh, surprise the consensus. And then you can always just come over here and see year-to-year -year revenue, which is always pretty significant number. And then guidance, whether it was up or down or flat for the quarter or for the year. Um, some pretty interesting stuff going on there overall. If you want a little bit more in-depth, you can always just click on this little plus sign right next to those um, the company name. And if you give it just a second to load in there, because there is a couple, there is a cu couple lines of information um, that is loaded up there. Uh, you get more of the summary. So you click on the, I clicked on the plus sign, and here I could just see United Rentals. Uh, how they beat, what happened there. I can see a little bit of a, a history the last four quarters um, just for a comparison basis. I can see the guidance for the last four quarters and I can also see uh, the last four to five analyst or brokerage uh, up actions or upgrades or downgrades on the stock. So just a little tidbit there if you're uh, new to the site and you want a little bit more in-depth information you can get it uh, there underneath the calendars and earnings results as opposed to uh, scrolling through in play. I do see that uh, CCI was actually... Uh, yeah, I was, ju I was just going to jump in there, Scott, and uh, run through that. Their earnings are out. Not the greatest uh, results. Uh, they did raise their outlook for FY 2018. However, their Q3 guidance is a little bit light. Not really seen much of a reaction in the uh, stock. Um, you know, re revenues were up 35% year over year, net income up 61% year over year, so that's certainly encouraging there. Um, uh, not really seeing anything that's sticking out. You know, we, we have that AMT as a 5G play, and the CCI is certainly in there, but we just really haven't seen the tailwind from that just yet. So we continue to look for, for that. I mean, this is... A, a decent quarter. It's an uneventful one, and we're not really seeing the stock uh, move all that much in it, and probably for pretty good reason, too. Uh, we'll continue to monitor this action and, of course, how this reflects in that AMT announcement. Um, in terms of this, uh, the small cells, a couple of comments in the... Um, in, in the report on that, but uh, they don't really break out that activity just yet. So, uh, you know, it's something we'll keep an eye out for on the conference call. Do a run through the transcript tomorrow and see if there's any uh, meaningful commentary on that sector. But uh, overall, not looking at this to be much of a uh, mover at all. So, just get, we'll just continue to monitor it.
All right, so that thinks, I th we think that uh, pretty much wraps up for this afternoon's earnings talk. I think we've hit all the major ones that we wanted to discuss, and uh, looks like most of them did come out there. Um, so we're just a matter of just uh, sh closing up shop here and waiting for those other names to come out tomorrow morning. Let's just take a quick look at them again before we sign off. Go to the earnings calendar. And it looks like, uh, go to tomorrow. Give it a second to load up. And a few of the names that we hit on uh, today was going to be uh, Danaher, DHR. We do have Domino's Pizza out tomorrow, DPZ. Dover, DOV, and Industrial might be a mover. Uh, we do have a couple banks here, EWBC and FitB. Uh, Genuine Auto Parts, so oh, that's an interesting one there. Key Corp, a bank, uh, Nucor, we highlighted that one earlier, P, uh, Philip Morris, PM, another one that we highlighted, um, SAP, all-time new highs, so that's going to be an interesting one, um, Taiwan Semiconductor, that should be pretty interesting too to see how the semiconductors respond to that one, uh, Travelers, and then finally we have uh, Union Pacific, see if it can capture a bid in response to the recent strong strength in in the transport space and the industrial space. Uh, so overall, you know, that's uh, that stays markets um, holding up pretty solid here. You have the S&P closing up here right around fresh, uh, what have we got there, about five, six months high, five or six month highs. We got the Dow still lagging overall in the year, but trying to get back up towards those June highs and kept playing catch up. Obviously, we have the NASDAQ pacing the way higher with uh, leadership in inter internet and technology and software names, a couple semiconductors, uh, and then we have mid caps and small caps. Really strong year to date, but a little bit uh, hesitation going on here as all the focus is on these larger cap earnings reports, uh, but it does look like in due time they're going to get uh, pretty volatile as more names are scheduled to come out uh, in coming weeks. Note that it is an expiration this Friday. This is going to be July's uh, third Friday, so it's expiration day. Tend to see a little bit of gaming action going on around key strike prices, so just to be careful uh, getting too aggressively uh, long and short on those days. It just seems like, um, in my experience, that expiration is not uh, typically uh, fun days to trade. So too many. Too many different agendas going on, if you know what I mean. Anyway, with that said, I uh, hope everyone has a great evening, and we'll be back on the air tomorrow morning.